Uh, my name is Tom Robertson. I'm the director at Fulbright here. I'm a historian. Uh, I'm an environmental history. Uh, I'm an environmental historian. I'm not actually going to talk today about the kind of sources that environmental historians use. Uh, they use the sources that other historians use, but also look at uh, the built environment, the kind of sources that are in the world around us that are still um, present with us even though they tell us about earlier moments in time. Um, there's uh, a fascinating story there. Uh, Pratyushti asked me to speak about archives, uh, archival collections in the U.S. So that's what I'm, I'm going to talk about today. Um, I won't refer much to my own uh, digging or uh, my own publications, but I, I mean, I'll mention I have one in the most recent uh, Sinhas that is a mixture of uh, documents from U.S. sources, um, not so much in that article from, U from Nepal sources, uh, though some are available. I also use interviews. Um, and uh, there was an article in last week's Nepali Times that's a small section of this that actually couldn't have been written without an interview uh, with um, the first American physician who worked with the U.S. mission here, 1952-1953. Um, I tracked him down, he was 88, living in Virginia, four hours drive from Washington, D.C. Uh, he'd never been back to Nepal, but his house was full of documents. He had lots of photographs. The photographs actually make, uh, some of them are in here, but the, uh, the photographs make the article, I think, um, uh, much more special than it would have been. All right, uh, let's... So I was trying to figure out what I could show you. Uh, so I looked through pictures that I had that related in one way or another to this story. And one of the ones I found was a fire in Singha Durbar in 1973. I think I've got that right. The way this connects is this fire is one reason why it's hard to find documents in Nepal covering a certain period. But it also helps to explain why certain collections in the U.S are among the best places in the world to go if you want to learn about Nepal and Nepal's history. <laughs> um, uh, there are a lot of individuals who pass through Nepal who have collections and there are state records, there are governmental records. Um, and so I'm going to tell you mostly, uh, I do environmental history but I also write about the history of development and a little bit of foreign relations history. So. I kind of uh, relied heavily on government collections. So that's, that's a lot of what I'll tell you about. Uh, there's a difference between libraries and archives. Um, the libraries in the United States, some of them, are also some of the best places to find materials about Nepal. You can find things in American libraries that you can't find in Nepal, even though they're about Nepal, even though they might be in Nepali. Um, I mean, just a, a few examples would be the University of Wisconsin Library, the Cornell University Library, University of Chicago, a number uh, of the ones that specialize in South Asia have really amazing collections. Plus, they're the kinds of books that Mark was talking about that are one or two little books or pamphlets that end up at some library some, somewhere for some reason. And if you can find them in a catalog, uh, they can be a fantastic resource. And sometimes all it takes is emailing the library and saying, hey, can you scan this 20-page document? Now, sometimes they'll say, forget about it. But sometimes they'll say, sure, why not? Nobody's ever asked us for that. <laughs> um, so there, there's, there's some really wonderful libraries. The, the Library of Congress in Washington would be another example. Let me get a sense here. How many people, actually I'm going to ask a question, not about libraries, but about American archives, U.S. archives. How many people have used 
archival collections in the U.S. to study about Nepal. Any, anybody here? Mm. So where and what were you studying? University of Wisconsin. Mm. Okay, and what, what collection? Did, did you use the library or archives? I think it's a library, it's not the archive. I do math education, so not, not many things available in the um, in archive. Did you find stuff in the library? I, I did. Right, so just think about that. A topic that um, seems kind of small and maybe unimportant, who would have collected materials on math education? And yet, I went to school at the University of Wisconsin. That's where I did my grad work. And I know what that library is like. Um, they were given lots of government money to collect absolutely anything and everything they could find related to Nepal. And so they have a huge collection. It's right there on the shelves, right? Um, who else was there? Yeah, please, where? Uh, I was at the Stanford University's uh, Hoover Archive. The Hoover Archive at Stanford. What were you looking at? I was looking at the UB Wood papers. Okay, another education story yes. from the 50s. Fantastic. So. That was an individual who had his own collection, and for one reason or another, it ended up at Stanford University, and so you can go and use that. How about you? Oh, I don't remember which archive it was. It was in the Harvard Library, and it was on like the like 1980s archive. Okay, all right. Especially the really big, well-funded libraries whether they get government money or they have private funds like Harvard, have just often have unbelievable collections. Yeah. So I just want to mention that you know I have used uh, the Brown University David Pingree special collection. They have like twenty-five thousand plus books and, and mathematics and, and astrology and uh, math history. All, all those uh, you know in, in different languages, mostly Sanskrit and, and Hindi and Nepali. So I just wanted to mention that too. Right, uh, fantastic. There are a number of these just unbelievably rich collections. Um, so, I mean, libraries will mostly have published materials, sometimes unpublished pamphlets and such. But archives tend to have papers, documents, unpublished, just put in a folder somewhere. Uh, I'll mention some of the, um, some of the best ones that are available. Uh, in the U.S., uh, World Bank and U.N. Uh, collections, U.N. in New York, World Bank in Washington. I haven't used either really in any depth, so I can't really say much, but I know they have good materials on, uh, on Nepal. Um, I've used a lot of U.S. government collections. The biggest, uh, by far, is the National Archives, which are actually not in Washington, D.C. Uh, the main big repository is outside Washington in suburban Maryland, in College Park, Maryland. Uh, the, the main one has historical, I mean, really famous documents like the Constitution. Um, this one has all the other documents, just the <coughs> documents of the daily operations. Um, I'll say more about them in a minute. Um, there's the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian is the sort of the U.S. government uh, national museum or series of museums. And so they've had researchers who've come to Nepal and they, they keep their papers. So some of the papers on Chitwan National Park, for instance, and tiger conservation projects uh, were organized through the Smithsonian, so that's one place to go for, for, for that kind of research. Um, I also found a number of old photographs online through the Smithsonian. I didn't have to go there. I just used the online sources. Um, there are a series of presidential libraries. Every president since um, uh, Franklin Roosevelt in the 30s has uh, his own library, normally in his hometown, not always, but normally. 
Um, and so, uh, for the early 50s, I went to the Harry Truman Library in Independence, Missouri, the Eisenhower Library for the later 50s, um, the John F. Kennedy Library, especially for something like the, the early Peace Score, but also all sorts of development documents. Uh, that's in Boston. Uh, the Lyndon Johnson Library is outside Austin, Texas. Uh, I know not many people will be able to go to the United States to use these resources. Um, that's not something I can uh, help too much with, even through Fulbright. Um, Fulbright does not give short-term uh, travel research grants. If somehow you have the chance, uh, by far, depending what you're looking for, by far the easiest place to start is these presidential libraries. They're smaller, they are infinitely better organized than the big national archives. Uh, they're much friendlier. With all of these, I would start by looking online to see what they've got. Uh, in some cases, all right, let's see. This, I'll, I'll come back to that thought in a second. This just gives you a sense of where the presidential libraries are. So Jimmy Carter's library is in Atl near Atlanta, Georgia. Um, let's see. So if you contact, this one pop up? Yes. If you contact one of the presidential libraries, sometimes the National Archives, if you ask them, hey, what do you have there? Or you can scan their records. And it happens that this is from the Eisenhower Library in Kansas. They actually have very nicely put together a document where they list everything in their collection related to Nepal. I don't know if this is because I asked them, hey, what's there, or whether they had already done it. Either way, it exists, and they'll email it to you. So just to give you a sense, I mean, essentially what they did is they looked for every reference to Nepal they could find easily. And so it's uh, the records of individual people. Um, for uh, some reason, um, this man, William Draper, who's actually famous for other reasons, uh, has records related to Nepal, related to the pickup of the king and queen of Nepal in 19, I think, yes, in April 1960. So he was involved in that. Now, chances are it's just a little slip of paper that doesn't really say much. Maybe there's a photograph, but it tells you the box, and then you can go find it. John Foster Dulles, right? Uh, the Secretary of State has several files that have material related to Nepal. So that just gives you an idea of what's there. Um, but that's how you figure it out. If you're interested in something from the mid or late 50s and you think the US government might have some material on it, uh, then you can email. You can get this, and then you can send a follow-up email. Hey, this box looks really interesting. Um, and maybe they'll give you more information. Maybe they'll scan it for you for free if it's just one or two documents. Maybe they'll say, hey, we'll scan it for you, but this is how much it'll cost. Uh, what kind of stuff would be at this kind of collection? Well, I mean, you can imagine the US government would have all, anything that the U.S. government is interested in related to Nepal. And that'll be official documents, right? But um, they may have someone who's, who gets really interested in education for some reason and just starts collecting materials. That person would have far more than just the, the letters or reports that their office create. Um, there could be all sorts of materials in Nepali um, little pamphlets, newspaper articles that would be impossible to find 
some other way. But all of a sudden, you find a folder that's all about education in 1959 and a whole mix of materials. Then you found um, one, of, one of the sort of nuggets that you're looking for. Um, so, so that gives you an idea of how to, how to go about this kind of search, where you could find some information. Um, the, the National Archives in College Park is big, it's poorly organized, some of its catalogs are online, so that's where I start. Uh, when I first went there uh, to begin to look at um, point four programs, Nepal, uh, U.S. government programs in the 50s here, and I was interested in environmental, I was opening boxes that had been shipped from Nepal in the mid-1980s, and essentially what they had done was go onto their shelves and take everything that they had and just drop it in the boxes. So I was the one open, I had, we had to get a paper cutter to uncut the top of them. Um, so they were not organized, they were not processed. Since then they have processed these, they've, they've organized them better. So the development records um, for Nepal are actually much better organized than they, they were just a few years ago. It's still a big, unwieldy place. So I'd start with the presidential libraries, but it's possible. There are other collections. Big institutions like the Rockefeller Foundation have their own collections, and they're pretty well funded, so they're very well organized. The Ford Foundation that did uh, work in Nepal for decades related to development, their collections used to be at the Ford Foundation headquarters in New York, but I think they've given them to the Rockefeller archive, and so they're part of that collection. And one thing that, that's nice about that is they give researchers some funding to come use their collection. I, and I, I think they don't care whether you're American or not. They just want to know that you've got a good project and you can use their collection. You'll have to write a proposal and compete with other people, but it's possible to get some funding for a place like that. It's an hour north of New York City. Individual people may have given their papers the ambassador to India and Nepal in the early 1950s, um, whose papers formed the bulk of this article, um, that man's name was Chester Bowles. He went to Yale University. He was governor of Connecticut. His papers are all at Yale, and you can go and use them. It's about an hour outside of New York City. You can ask your friends who live nearby to go use this collection and look for you. You can ask them if, if you find, they have the same thing. They have a catalog. They're, they're called finding aids for archives in the US. Um, they have a catalog of his collection. And I, I'll show you. Um, let's see, where have I got this? So, I, this, this is just to give you a sense of, of what, what, what you can find. So here's, here's a section on correspondence, CB means Chester Bowles, Nepal, the government of Nepal, officials, BJ, Shamsher, right? So there's communication back and forth. MP Kora, um, Kudgaman Singh, They've got letters back and forth, and you can go look at them. And if, if they're only, if you're interested in absolutely everything, they're not going to make copies for you. Um, but if you're interested in one or two, they might. Uh, there's King Tribovan. Um, information about his trips. There's a whole folder on land reform. Um, photographs by Paul Rose. Um, there's a lot of great material. It's fun just to go, and if you're ever in the actual archive, 
instead of just going narrowly to what you want, you gotta, just like you're browsing in a library, look at what's to the left and to the right of what you're mm. interested in. Um, speeches, other articles, all sorts of things. So that covers governmental uh, collections, institutional collections, individual people and their collections. Um, this is just what the reading room looks like, the National Archives in College Park. Um, it looks like a very pleasant place to work. It's, it's just very bureaucratic. Um, and it uh, might be harder to get some of those materials than it is to get materials in Nepal. Um, and maybe not as well organized. Uh, this is the Yale Library where I looked at the Chester Bowles stuff. Uh, a few recommendations. I already mentioned, start with the president, if, depending what you're looking for. If you're looking for US government stuff, start with the presidential libraries. Look for little pots of money, especially smaller libraries or private libraries, or rich universities and their libraries. Uh, electronic records. Email an archivist. If you an email an archivist, be very careful. They are not going to want to do work for you that you could have done by yourself already. So that's what I mean by do your homework first. If you haven't looked through their web page and you say, please, do everything for me, they're going to move on to another email. They're going to want to help. They'll want to help. Um, people from other countries to begin with, and they're, for the most part, very, very helpful people. But they're going to want to help the people who've already looked into it and seem serious and organized. One note on this, electronic records. USAID, uh, the US, you know, the main US development agency, has an electronic database called the Development Experience Clearinghouse. If you are interested in writing about development in Nepal, this ought to be one of the first places, especially the history, this ought to be one of the first places you go to. It's meant for consultants to put, consultants working this month to put their reports online. But what they've got is documents that go back to the 70s and 60s. Uh, in some cases, even into the 50s. Well, you can down, they've scanned most of these documents. You can search relatively easily, and you can download the documents. Development Experience Clearinghouse. It's just a strange name, um, but it's the USAID online repository for documents related to development. It's absolutely amazing. A few requests. If you are lucky enough to visit one of these archives, please take pictures of it. And in fact, I mean, the way um, experienced researchers work at the archives is that they rarely have enough time to stay there for a month at a time. They will take pictures, they will scan as much as they possibly can. But if uh, you get a chance to go, please do that. Because then if you get permission, you can put those online and other people, people from Nepal who can't go to the US can use those documents. I have hundreds, if not thousands of documents that I'm preparing to um, make available this way. Uh, things. These are documents that I needed directly, but they're also ones that I just knew would be useful, so I took pictures of that. Mm. Make sure if you do that, you have the little tag that says you have the permission of this library to take this photo. Um, it would be wonderful to get a guide to the archives here in Nepal. It sounds like um, there's a lot of great information out there. John Welton put one together a number of years ago that needs to be updated. Um, also, this is related to what Mark said. There are lots of materials out there that haven't been collected. 
into uh, archives. Uh, Mark works related to hippies, so he wants everything related to hippies. I work related to development, so I want everything related to development. Um, that can be the materials collected by Nepalis, by Americans, by whoever. But those folks have huge collections sometimes just sitting in a room someplace. We need to encourage them not to throw them away, but to give them to a library or an archive. All right, I'll end there. Thank you very much.